So you should absolutely not watch this review video until you've completed the entire review by yourself. This is not designed to teach you. It's just to design this. Me doing the review is just to help you check what you know or don't know, but it's not designed to you know, teach you the topics. You should know how to do all these problems, or at least most of the problems before you watch the video. As you're watching the video, you should you know, just really be focusing on the problems that when you tried the review that you didn't get the right answer to. So you should definitely not be watching this video until you've done this review yourself. So 1a wants me to find an x-intercept. To find an x-intercept, we set the function equal to zero. I can expand out these parentheses if I want. And if I expand out the parentheses, I get two parentheses of an x minus five, one with an x minus three. I'm gonna set each of those um, factors equal to zero. I don't have to set both x minus fives equal to zero because I get the same answer of five for both of them. So when I set the factors equal to zero, I get x equal to five when I add five to both sides for the x minus five, x equal three for the other factor. That's gonna make x-intercepts or points on my graph of five, zero, and three, zero. The graph is going to touch the x-axis at the five, zero, cross the x-axis at the three, zero, because the x minus five, because there's two of them, the x-intercept of 5, 0 has even multiplicity. Because there's only one x minus 3, the, the x-intercept of 3, 0 has odd multiplicity. So we say when we get to the graph at the point 5, 0, the graph isn't going to cross off the x-axis, cross the x-axis. It's just going to bounce off the x-axis. Whereas at the point 3, 0, the graph is physically going to cross across the x-axis at that point. If I multiply the first x in each parentheses in the expanded version, I get x cubed. This function, if you zoom your window out far enough, will look like the graph of x cubed. Because this is a third degree polynomial, it could have at most two per turning points. Always you get one less, the maximum number of turning points is one less than the, the exponent. And then the end behavior I'm going to steal from the graph. I think a standard window will work fine for this problem, but I don't know that for a fact yet, but I'm going to hit my y equals have a bunch of stuff in there I'm going to clear out. Now I'm going to type x minus 5 squared times x minus 3. I'm just going to do a zoom standard and hopefully oh, not make a mistake. Error. Oh, that I didn't type an x or somehow I hit the 8. Now going to my standard window. I actually think that window is probably suitable for my graph. I might want to narrow the y's a little bit um, so I can get these turning points a little bit more clearly displayed. So let me just hit my window button, crunch the y's down to the fives. You don't have to do this, but I think it's going to make it easier when I go to find the, the coordinates of the turning points. That's probably a better picture. So ultimately, I'm going to copy that picture on my graph. There's the x-intercept at 3, 0 where the graph crosses. There's the x-intercept at 5, 0 where the graph touches. That 5, 0 is also a turning point. Um, before I flip this page, the end behavior, the left side of the graph is going down, so we say it falls to the left. The right edge of the graph is going up, we say it rises to the right. So let me add that for the end behavior, that this graph falls to the left and rises to the right. So I'm about to sketch a graph, and then after I have the graph sketched, I'll label where the graph is increasing and decreasing. So let me just draw a generic 
axes, I know I have x-intercepts at 3, 0, and 5, 0. And I'm going to copy this graph more or less how it looks, except I'm going to label a point up here, that, that turning point, which is a maximum. I get it by going second calc maximum, trace to the left of the high point, the maximum point or the turning point, hit enter, trace to the right of the maximum point, hit enter, get as close as I can to the maximum point and hit enter, and I round to two decimal places. So 3.66, which is probably three and two thirds, I'm gonna write 3.67, 1.19. So 3.67, 1.19, maybe that's about there. And again, when my turning points have decimals, I generally round to two decimals, that would be fine for the test. Now I'm just gonna copy this graph on, I'm just gonna make this shape the best I can, it doesn't have to be perfect. So that's perfect. I've labeled the x-intercepts. I approximated the turning points. The turning points are 3.67, 1.19, and 5.0. The graph goes up and to the right forever, down and to the left forever. When I want to answer part G, the increasing and decreasing, the first region that I drew from the beginning of the graph up until the first turning point, the graph is increasing. So I'm going to write an up arrow to represent increasing. And that starts way at the left edge of the graph at x equal negative infinity, even though I haven't shown the graph going over that far, up until x equals 3.67. And then after I get to the turning point, the graph goes down for a bit, and so it's going to be decreasing in this region between the maximum and the minimum. And that's the interval in terms of x from 3.67 to 5. And then lastly, after the minimum or x-intercept, the graph turns and goes up for the rest of the time from x equals 5 all the way to the right edge of the x-axis to infinity. So I'm going to write those for my increasing and decreasing. Look, I use up arrows for increasing, down arrows for decreasing, but I certainly didn't have to do that. I can write the word increasing and decreasing if I care to. So that's everything for problem one that I need to do. Problem two is going to feel similar in that it asks me basically the same sorts of things with a different function. So I'm going to take the function itself, the right-hand side of the equation, and set it equal to zero. And it's nice that it's factored. The fact that it's factored makes my life a little bit easier. So I'm going to set the x squared minus 16 equal to zero. And I'm going to set the 3x minus 21 equal to zero. Neither factor has an exponent of 2 outside of it, or 4 or 6, so both all the zeros are going to have odd multiplicity, and the graph's going to cross the x-axis as opposed to bounce off or touch the x-axis. The x squared plus 16 I'm going to solve by factoring. That's a difference of squares. It factors into x plus 4 times x minus 4. The 3x minus 21, I'm going to add 21 and get 3x equal to 21, and then divide by 3 and get x equal to 7. For this x plus 4, x minus 4, I have to go x plus 4 equal to 0, x minus 4 equal to 0. For the x plus 4 equal to 0, I'll minus 4 from both sides and get x is negative 4. For the x minus 4 equal to 0, I add 4 to both sides and get x equal to 4. So the x-intercepts I'm going to get, here's a negative 4, 0, a positive 4, 0, and this 21 over 3 is going to give me a 7, 0. Every one of them is going to have odd multiplicity because none of the factors had an exponent of 2. There weren't dual factors that made the same 0. So for each of the x-intercepts at negative 4, 0, the graph is going to cross the x-axis. At positive 4, 0, the graph is going to cross the x-axis. And at positive 7, 0, the graph is also going to cross the x-axis, so I'm not going to get the graph touching and bouncing off the x-axis. Next thing, the maximum number of turning points, I'm just going to multiply 
the firsts in the expanded version of this. I multiply x squared times 3x. That's going to give me 3x cubed. This function, if I graphed 3x cubed and this function on the same graph and made a really large window, you wouldn't be able to distinguish the graphs really well. This is another third degree polynomial, so it has a maximum or at most two turning points. Can't have more than two turning points, but it could even have no turning points. Describing the end behavior, I'm going to steal that from my graph. So I'm graphing y equals, clear this out, x squared minus 16 times 3x minus 21. I graphed this earlier, and I think I have to get really extreme on the y's, but the x's from negative 10 to 10 will work. If I hit graph right now with the standard window, I'm not going to see very well the graph because the graph gets really high and really low and I'm really not that happy at all with that but oh I'm missing a parenthesis with the x squared minus 16 oh. second insert parentheses now let's see if that it's still not going to be a good window but at least now I could see there's the x-intercept at negative 4 where the graph crosses the x-axis the x-intercept at 4 and 7 the graph crosses the x-axis for all the x-intercepts I need to get higher to see the top of the graph lower to see the bottom of the graph and I think doing changing my y min to go down to like negative oh it's at negative 64 so um, at negative 70 or negative 80 and to change my y max it turns out that I have to bounce all the way up to 400 to be able to see the top of the graph and when you get to the test I'm going to give you something that looks like this I'm not going to give you the graph but you're going to have axes and the axes will have numbers on them and the numbers on the axes will help you identify the window so I can't barely read this because I have old eyes but um, I know because there's a maximum value of 360 a minimum value at negative 64.5 that the window that I set is going to be adequate for seeing the top and the bottom of the graph. And again, you won't have to play with the window. You'll just have to look at the blank graph, look at the numbers on the axes, and it'll help you get your window. So there's a reasonable picture. For n behavior, again, this falls on the left side, rises on the right side. So I can say it falls to the left, and it rises to the right the left side is going down, the right side is going up. I'm going to find that and that turning point. So I'm getting ready to do a graph. I know on my graph, I already know the x-intercepts are negative 4, positive 4, and positive 7. So I need to find the point negative 4, 0, positive 4, 0, and positive 7, 0, and label all those. In addition to those three points, because I'm supposed to label the x-intercepts, I'm going to label the turning points, and I'm going to you know, kind of mimic this. So I'm going to get one turning point kind of up here, and I'm going to get another turning point down here. I'm just going to find the coordinates of those real quickly. This one's a maximum, so I go second calc, maximum, trace to the left of the high point, hit enter, to the right of the high point, hit enter, as close as I can to the high point, hit enter. I'm going to round to two decimals. I'm going to round that to negative 0.95 and then 360.02, I guess. So I'm going to write negative 0.95, comma. If I just wrote 360, that would be adequate. But I'm going to write 360.08, I guess. That's that point rounded both properly to two decimals. Now I'll find the minimum, second calc, minimum, trace, so I get close to the low point but to the left of it. Hit enter, trace to the other side of the low point, hit enter, then get as close as I can to that low point and hit enter. And I get like 5.62, so this point's gonna be 
5.62 comma negative 64.52. On my solutions manual, I didn't round to two decimals like I'm doing here. Um, it, I'm content with two decimals every time, but if you give me slightly less or slightly more than two decimals, it's just not that big of a deal if your rounding is, is a little bit different than mine, just as long as you have the right feel. So now I'm just gonna copy this graph, more or less how it looks making sure it crosses at the x-axis, each of the intercepts it crosses as opposed to doesn't touch. And I should probably put arrows at the end of my graphs, but I often forget to do that. But that would be a reasonable picture with or without the arrows, the arrows meaning it goes on. For the increasing and decreasing part of this, the beginning part of the graph from the far left edge of the x-axis, which is at negative infinity, up until that turning point, has an x-coordinate of negative 0.95, the graph is increasing. And then from this turning point or that maximum to the next turning point or that minimum, the graph is going down. And in terms of x, that's the region from negative 0.95 to 5.62. And then the last region from the minimum or the turning point that has an x-coordinate of 5.62 all the way to the end of the graph, which would have an x-coordinate of infinity, the graph is increasing. So that would be everything you need to do for number two. Again, I won't make you, I won't force you to figure out what the windows are. I'll give the windows for you. Another graph, I'm surprised I have three graphs on this review. It seems like a little bit of overkill, but we do, so I'll, I'll do them. So same deal for number three. It's a, I don't know if it's harder or easier, it's just different. When I go to find the x-intercepts, because it's not factored, I'm gonna to need to factor it. Still gonna set the problem equal to zero. I'm gonna pull out a common factor of an x squared. When I factor out that x squared, I'm left with x squared minus four x minus 21. Still have the equal to zero. I'm going to factor the x squared minus 4x minus 21 to x plus 3 times x minus 7. So I have it equal to 0. I'm going to take each of my factors and set them equal to 0. I'm going to go x squared equal to 0. And to do that, really usually you go square root plus or minus square root. The square root of x squared is x. The square root of zero is zero, and there isn't a plus or minus zero. Plus zero is just zero, minus zero is just zero. So this gives me an x-intercept of zero, zero. So the first of my three x-intercepts is zero, zero. The exponent on that factor was two, which is an even number. So we're gonna say the graph has even multiplicity. And when I go to sketch the graph, at the point zero, zero, the graph is gonna to touch but not cross the x-axis. For the other two factors, the factor of x plus three, when I set it equal to zero, I subtract three from both sides and get x equal to negative three. That gives an x-intercept of negative three, zero. There's no exponent with that factor, so there's an implied one, which was an odd number, so that has odd multiplicity. And at the point negative three, zero, the graph is gonna cross the x-axis as opposed to touch the x-axis. The last factor of x minus seven, when I set that equal to zero, you get x equal to seven. That gives me an x-intercept of seven, zero. Again, with the odd multiplicity, because there's no exponent with that factor, so there's an implied one as the exponent. Or you don't see an exponent, so there's an implied one. Makes the exponent odd, makes it an odd multiplicity, makes the graph touch, I mean, cross the x-axis as opposed to touch. This, I don't have to multiply out to know the answer to part D. This function, if I make a big enough window, its graph will look like x to the fourth. This is a fourth degree polynomial, so I can't have more than three turning points. I'm gonna say it has at most three turning points. So those two questions, part C and part D, are easier because it's not factored. Part A and part B are a little bit harder because it's not factored. I 
Also, I'm going to have issues with my windows again. I did um, the X's at the 10's, the Y's at the 400, well, maybe at the negative 500's even. So it needs, I need a really extreme window to um, see everything that, I, that there is to see on this. So I'm going to sketch a graph. And again, when you get to the test, I'll have something that looks like this, but blank. You'll be able to look at the numbers on the Y axis. It says 400s. I probably have to really go to the 500s to actually see that. And then um, on the X axis, mine says negative seven to nine. Um, that would probably be adequate. But I'll make the window so you, I'll make the graph on the review for you to sketch your graph something that has numbers on the X and the Y axis so you have an idea of where to set your window. So I'm gonna graph this function, Y equals clear X up arrow fourth minus four X up arrow cubed minus 21 X squared. And then window, it looks to me like I wrote negative seven to nine. So negative seven, enter nine, enter. I'm gonna make my Y's at the 500s sketch a graph so I can answer the increasing or the end behavior and my end behavior on both sides this is rising so I'm going to say it rises both to the left and to the right I'm going to start sketching a graph I'm going to put my three x intercepts knowing that the graph is going to cross there at negative three zero touch but not cross at zero zero and cross at seven zero I can see all that already I'm going to need to find that minimum point and that minimum point let me get this minimum point real quickly I'm going to go second calc minimum trace to the left of that minimum point or that turning point hit enter trace to the right of that turning point and hit enter and get as close as I can to that turning point and hit enter so the point negative 2.07 negative 36.14 as a point that I'm going to have to label along with the three X intercepts and this point down there that I need to compute. So as I get ready to do my graph, I'm going to label the X intercepts. The X intercepts were negative three zero. I'm going to call that negative three zero, even though it might not really be. 0, 0, and 7, 0. And I just found this point, negative 2.07, negative 36.14. I need to also find this point way down here. And I'm going to do a second calc minimum for that. So I'm going to go second calc minimum, get my tracer going, get close to that low point, but to the left of it, hit enter, get on the other side of that low point and hit enter, and get as close as I can to that end point and hit enter. And so for this, I'm going to write 5.07 comma negative 400.36. So I've done a lot of the sketching the graph part. I've approximated the turning points. I've labeled the x-intercepts. Now I'm just gonna sketch a graph that looks more or less like what I have on my calculator. So I'm gonna do this. Touching at the zero, zero, crossing at the negative three and the seven, zero. That's again, more or less what my calculator has. Arrows at the end signifying the graph goes on forever would be nice, but not necessary absolutely for testing purposes. If I trace to the turning points between the beginning of the graph and the first turning point, the graph is decreasing. Put a down arrow for that. That's a region between negative infinity and negative 2.07 in terms of the x's. And then from this turning point to the next turning point, that's the interval between negative 2.07 and zero. The graph is increasing. Up arrow for the increasing. And then between the zero, zero turning point and the 5.07 negative 400 turning point, the graph is decreasing. 
I'm going to write 0 to 5.07. And then from the last turning point to the end of the graph, which is the region to, from 5.07 to infinity, the graph is increasing the whole way. Okay, so that's the last of graphing polynomials. I imagine there's some fraction graphs coming up, but we won't have to um, do that right yet. So the next section's on synthetic division. 4a says, take, make a graph of this, find a zero. So I can do synthetic division, so I can use that synthetic division to factor. I don't need double synthetic division because this is a cube. So I'm just going to graph this with a standard window. Find any place where the graph crosses the x-axis. If there's two places where it crosses the x-axis, I only need one of the two and it doesn't matter which of the two I pick. If you did your work and you picked the, the opposite x-intercept, ultimately your final answer is going to be the same. Your work from the beginning to the end will look remarkably different, but it won't mess you up in terms of a final answer. So there's the function, more or less. Now I'm hitting a zoom standard, trying to find out where this graph crosses the x-axis. crosses at negative 1, negative 3, and positive 3. And when I did this on my key, our solutions manual, I picked x equal to 3. But you can do synthetic division with x equal to 3, x equal to negative 1, or x equal to 3. So I only need one zero because it's a third degree polynomial. I know that x equals 3 is a 0 or an intercept. Zeros and x-intercepts, you can use those interchangeably. If I move the 3 over, I get x minus 3 as a factor. So when I get my synthetic division done and get that remainder of 0, the synthetic division is going to tell me that the answer to the synthetic division times x minus 3 is what this factors into. So I'm going to do my synthetic division. I'm going to put a 3 and a little backwards hook in the coefficients, 1 in front of the x cubed, 1 in front of the x squared, minus 9 in front of the x, minus 9 for the constant, bring down the 1, multiply 3 times 1 is 3, add 1 and 3 is 4, multiply 3 times 4 is 12, Add negative 9 and 12 is 3. Multiply 3 times 3 is 9. Add and get 0. Because I started with a cube and only did one synthetic division, my exponent here is going to be a 2. So that's going to be x squared plus 4x plus 3. Because I had a remainder of 0, the factor that came from the 0 that I used and the polynomial that comes from the answer from the synthetic division, if you multiply those, those will multiply out to be the original problem. So I can factor completely by factoring what's in the parentheses with the square, and that's going to give me my answer. So this original problem factors into x minus 3 times, and that parentheses factors into x plus 1 times x plus 3. So in your answer to problem 4, you need to have three parentheses. The order that you write the parentheses in doesn't have to be the same as mine, but one has to have an x minus 3, one x plus 1, and one x plus 3. And then you can scramble the order around. On my key, I have x minus 3 first, x plus 3 second, x plus 1 third. There isn't a right and a wrong order. It's just whatever you come up with. They're all equivalently correct. Five, I need to do the same thing. I need to factor. I'm going to do double synthetic division. I'm going to graph the problem. Because it's a fourth degree polynomial, to get a fourth degree down to a second, I need double synthetic division. I'm going to go x up arrow 4 plus 3x up arrow 3 minus 8x squared minus 12x plus 16. Graph it. I need two x-intercepts. Looks to me like I can find four x-intercepts. It looks to me like... 1, 2, negative 2, and negative 4 are all x-intercepts. I only need two of them, and I picked 1 and 2, so I picked one, x equal 1 and x equal to 2. If I hit second in table, you could see that at 1, the y is 0, and at 2, the y is 0. So those are good, in, good ones to use. So I'm going to use x equal to 1 and x equal to 2 for my synthetic divisions. 
The fact that x equals 1 is something I'm going to use in my synthetic division. The factor that comes from that when you set it equal to 0 is x minus 1. Similarly, the factor that comes from x equal to 2 is x minus 2. So when I do my double synthetic division, I'm going to get x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 8x squared minus 12x plus 16 equals to x minus 1 times x minus 2, and then times the result of the second of the double synthetic division. I'm going to do the 1 first. I'm going to write a 1 in a backwards hook, and then the coefficients of the x to the fourth. I go 1, 3, negative 8, negative 12, 16. Bring down the 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. That's my first synthetic division. My second synthetic division, I'm going to use the 2, and I'm not going to use the remainder, so I'm going to use just the 1, 4, negative 4, and negative 16, and the 2. Bring down the 1, multiply 2 times 1 and get 2, add 4 and 2 and get 6, multiply 2 times 6 and get 12, Add negative 4 and 12 and get positive 8. Multiply 2 times 8 and get 16. Add and get 0. This is the remainder. Getting a remainder of 0 is nice. I did double synthetic division. My initial problem had a fourth degree. The polynomial that comes from this is going to be a second degree, so it's going to be 1x squared plus 6x plus 8. And instead of writing 1x squared, I'm going to write x squared plus 6x plus 8. So the synthetic division gives me that part of the factoring to get my complete answer. The completely factored, I need to factor this x squared plus 6x plus 8. So the answer, the factored form of the original polynomial is going to be x minus 1 times x minus 2. And then here I'm going to get an x plus 2 and an x plus 4 because that's how that factors. And so your answer to problem 5 needs to have four parentheses. The order that you write the parentheses in isn't important at all. If you had x plus 4 for your second parentheses, x minus 1 for your last parentheses, that would absolutely not matter. That's irrelevant. This is, if you foiled this out, it would foil out to be the original problem. As everything is asked for number 5. 6 wants me to solve. I'm going to solve this by doing double synthetic division. I have to get two of the answers from my calculator, and then the other two answers I'll get by synthetic division. So I'm going to graph this, y equals clear x up arrow fourth minus 13x squared plus 36. Graph it, find two answers. Looks to me like both 2 and 3 are answers. So I'm going to say x equals 2 is one of my answers. x equals 3 is another one of my answers. Actually, negative 2 and negative 3 are the other answers. When I get to finally answer this problem, I know the four answers. I don't, if you just write the four answers without showing me the synthetic division, you're going to lose lots of points because I need to see some sort of work. Although I can get all the answers. The answers to where this polynomial equals 0 are any place where it crosses the x-axis. And on my calculator, I was able to see all those places. But I'm going to do double synthetic division. I'm going to factor this. And in order to factor this, if I'm using x equal to 2, that's going to give me a factor of x minus 2. Using x equal to 3, that's going to give me a factor of x minus 3. So when I get done with my double synthetic division, I'll be able to take the problem that wasn't factored and factor it into x minus 2 times x minus 3 times the result of the double synthetic division. So let me do that. So I'm going to know to add some things in here. This has to be written with an x cubed and an x to the first power term. Otherwise, synthetic division doesn't work well. You need a spot for every power of x. I'm going to do my first synthetic division with a 2. I'll pull off the coefficients of 1, 0, negative 13, 0, and 36. Bring down the 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, 
add, multiply, add. Do my second synthetic division with the three using the one, two, negative nine, and negative 18. Bring down the one, multiply, three times one is three, add two and three is five, multiply three times five is 15, add negative five, negative nine and 15 is six, multiply three times six is 18, add and get zero. I started with a fourth degree polynomial, did double synthetic division, so this has to be a second degree polynomial, so this is gonna give me x squared plus five x plus six, so synthetic division, or double synthetic division, gave me the ability to factor that. I'm gonna completely factor it by factoring the x squared piece. That factors into x plus two times x plus three. So now I have it both factored and set equal to zero. I'm gonna take each factor and set each factor equal to zero. For the x minus two, I'll get an answer of two. For the x minus three, I'll get an answer of three. For the x plus two, I'll get an answer of negative two. And for the x plus three, I'll get an answer of negative three. So my answers are gonna be plus or minus two, plus or minus three. You don't have to write the two twos out twice. You could have written plus or minus two, comma, plus or minus three, x equals. That would be equivalently a correct answer. If on the test I gave you something that had square roots, fractions or i's for the answer, then you couldn't just get all the answers by looking at your calculator. And that's going to be the case with number seven. On number seven, two of the answers have square roots, which you, so you won't be able to get all the answers like you could for this. When I have a fourth degree polynomial, I expect to get four answers. In problem seven, because I have a third degree polynomial set equal to zero, I expect to get three answers. Just like I did for the last problem, I'm gonna get a starting point. I only need one because this is a cube. If there's a square, I need two. So I'm gonna go x up arrow three plus x squared plus two x plus two. Graph it, find an x-intercept. Apparently, this has an x-intercept at negative one. I'm gonna make sure it's negative one by going second table, and then next to negative one, I see a zero. So neg x equals negative one is an x-intercept, which means x plus one is a factor of that polynomial. So ultimately, I'm gonna take the polynomial x cubed plus x squared plus two x plus two, and I'm gonna factor it. It's gonna factor into x plus one times something, and that times something I'm gonna get from doing the synthetic division with the negative one. I'm gonna write my coefficients one, one, two, and two put the negative one in the backwards L, backwards bracket, bring down the one, multiply negative one times one is negative one, add negative one and one and get zero, multiply negative one times zero and get zero, add two and zero and get two, multiply negative one times two and get negative two, add and get zero. This is the remainder. I started with a third degree polynomial, did one synthetic division, so this is a, a second degree. This is actually one X squared, plus zero x plus two remainder of zero. In this parentheses, I'm gonna put the result of the synthetic division and I'm just gonna write x squared plus two as opposed to writing the zero x. Now to answer the question, I have the problem factored and set equal to zero. So I set the factors equal to zero. I go x plus one equal to zero, x squared plus two equal to zero. For the x plus one, I already know the negative one solution because I got it from my calculator. For the x squared plus two, I'm gonna minus two from both sides and get x squared equals negative two. And then I'm gonna go square root plus or minus square root. The square root of x squared is just x. The square root sign doesn't go away on the right-hand side because two is not a reducible square root, but I get an i because of the negative under the square root. So there's three answers to this problem, negative one, is the only real numbered answer. And then i square root of two and negative i times the square root of two are the imaginary answers. So there's three answers. Only one of them showed up as the x-intercept because the other imaginary ones, the imaginary answers don't show up on a graph. Next two problems are grungy. 
uh, eight is grungier than number nine, both of which want me to create a third degree polynomial. So I have to multiply three factors, all writing x minus something. And I need to remember that if anytime you have a root with an i, it, they come in pairs. And so if three plus i is a root, so is three minus i. So I'm going to write the polynomial or the function that's going to satisfy the conditions by going x minus x minus and x minus. And what I'm going to subtract is each of these. And I'm going to do the i's first just to get them over with. So I'm going to go x minus 3 plus i, x minus 3 minus i, and x minus a negative 2. I'm going to get rid of all the orangey gold parentheses that I wrote. It's going to give me x minus 3 minus i times x minus 3 plus i times x plus 2. Foil out the first parentheses, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to leave the x plus 2 alone, and I'm going to get something to write in front of the x plus 2. That's what this junk multiplies into. Lots of multiplication to do that. I'm going to start taking the x, multiplying it by the three things in the middle parentheses. So I'm going to go x times x, x times minus 3, and x times i. This gives me x squared minus 3x plus ix. Now I'll work with the minus 3. I'll go minus 3 times x, minus 3 times minus 3, and minus 3 times i. Minus 3 times x, I write a minus 3x. Minus 3 times minus 3, I write a plus 9. Minus 3 times i, I might write a minus 3i. Now I'm going to work with the minus i. I'm going to go minus i times x, minus i times minus 3, and minus i times i. Minus i times x, I'm going to write as a minus ix. Minus i times minus 3, I'm going to write as a plus 3i. And minus i times i, I'm going to write as a minus i squared. A lot of the i pieces cancel. This ix and that minus ix cancel. And this plus 3i and that minus 3i cancel. So what doesn't cancel is an x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. And then minus i squared, which I'm going to write as minus a negative 1 because this i squared is equal to negative 1. I'm going to simplify this, write that in the parentheses next to the x plus 2. The x squared's not going to change. The 2 minus 3x is combined to be a minus 6x. And the 9 minus negative 1, that double negative goes to plus. That's 9 plus 1, which is 10. So I get x squared minus 6x plus 10 times x plus 2. I'm going to multiply this out by taking x squared, multiplying it by each thing. So I'm going to go x squared times x and x squared times 2. That's taking the x squared by those two things. That gives me an x cubed plus a 2x squared. Now I'm going to take the minus 6x and go minus 6x times x minus 6x times 2. Minus 6x times x is minus 6x squared. Minus 6x times 2 is minus 12x. And now with the 10, 10 times x and 10 times 2. 10 times x is plus 10x. 10 times 2 is plus 20. I'm going to combine like terms. That's going to be my answer. So the answer to problem 8 is going to be f of x equals the x cubed is going to stay. Those two terms, the exponent doesn't change, but the coefficient changes. 2 minus 6 is negative 4, so I'm going to write a negative 4x squared. These two terms, the x isn't going to change, but the number in front of the x it will change to negative 12 plus 10, which is negative 2. And I'm going to bring down the plus 20. So I claim that's the answer. Easy to check by taking any one of the initial zeros and plugging it in for x. I'm going to plug 3 plus i in for each of the x's and do that on my calculator and show you that I get 0. If when I plug 3 plus i in for the x's I don't get 0, then I've messed up. So I'm going to go 3 plus i quantity cubed. This isn't part of the solution. This is just checking. Minus 4 times 3 plus i squared 
minus 2 times 3 plus i plus 20. So I've entered the problem replacing the x's with one of the zeros, 3 plus i. If when I hit enter, I see something other than 0, I've made a mistake. If I see 0, I'm probably right. To be 100% sure that I'm right, I'd also have to plug negative 2 in and 3 minus i in. That takes too long, and usually if you get one of the complicated ones right, you're right. And this is the ugly, ugly notation. This means move my decimal 12 places to the left. I get a, a decimal, 11 zeros, a negative number, a decimal, 11 zeros, a 2, and then an i. And for my, because my calculator doesn't really do work with I, it does regular, regular work. It does some sort of algorithm that approximates the work with I. That, when you see the E with a negative exponent, with a large negative exponent, that's equivalent to zero for my calculator. Let me just do the negative two first to make sure that I'm, that won't give me anything funky. So I'm gonna go negative two, up arrow three, minus four times negative two, squared minus 2 times negative 2 plus 20. And when I do that, I get the perfect 0. And because my calculator doesn't really do I's like we would do I's by hand, um, sometimes you get these E's with negatives, which we have to call 0 even though they're not perfectly 0. It's because my calculator is, is flawed a little bit. So 9's a lot easier because I don't have comp that ugly roots. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to create three parentheses with an x minus. And once I have one i root, the negative of it or the conjugate of it is the other. So I'm going to make this f of x equals, and I'm going to have an x minus, an x minus, and an x minus. Because I want a third degree polynomial, I need three parentheses with x is up front. I'm going to do an x minus 4i an x minus negative 4, I like getting the i's out of the way, and an x minus a negative 5. So in each parentheses, I put a 4i, minus 4i, and a minus 5. The double negatives, I'm going to make positive. So I'm going to get an x minus 4i, an x plus 4i, and x plus 5. Way easier to FOIL this. First of all, the first pair, those are conjugate pairs. I only the outers and the inners are going to cancel. I only need to do the first and the last. So the foiling's way quicker. So on the first, uh, these first two, I'm going to do the first. x times x is x squared. Last, minus 4i times 4i is minus 16i squared. And then this minus 16i squared is going to be a plus 16 because it's really minus 16 times a minus 1, which is plus 16 because i squared is a negative 1. So this comes out to be x squared plus 16 times x plus 5. I'm going to multiply now the x squared by the x, the x squared by the 5. x squared by the x gives me an x cubed. x squared by the 5 gives me a 5x squared. I'll take the 16, multiply it by the x. 16, multiply it by the 5. 16 times x is 16x. 16, 16 times 5 is 80. There's no like terms there. This is going to be my answer. The answer to problem 9 is going to be f of x equals x cubed plus 5x squared plus 16x plus 80. And if I want to check, I can take any of these, negative 5, 4i, or negative 4i, plug it in for the x's. And when you do that plugging in, you should get 0. I'm going to plug 4i in for the x's. If it comes out to be 0, I'm banking that I'm right. Or if it comes out to be something that has a e with a negative exponent. So I do 4i cubed plus 5 times 4i. And again, this is completely optional, but it takes me about 20 seconds to check. And I like knowing that I'm right, especially on a test, so I don't lose points that I don't need to lose. So that's just plugging 4i in for each of the x's. When I hit enter, hopefully I see 0. I, because I see zero, I believe my answer is 100% right. Although, to be 100% sure, you should also do negative 4i the same way and negative 5 the same way. But if one of the three works, then the chances of the other two working are pretty high. So that's everything for number nine. Getting close to the end of the review, the next couple problems are graphing fractions. And just like if I asked to graph 
you to graph a polynomial, I'm going to give you a blank graph that has the window that you need. So you're not going to need to guess at what the window is. In this problem, the window, if we go from negative 8 to 8 on the x's, or on the y's, on the x's, I'm going to go from negative 18 to 18. And on the y's, I'm going to go from negative 8 to 8. And again, when you get to the test, you'll be given a graph that looks like this, but it's going to be completely blank in terms of it's not going to have the horizontal vertical asymptotes, it's not going to have the intercepts marked, but it will have numbers on the axes, so you won't have to play at getting the window. So um, you won't have to worry about that. For what it's worth, what I'm displaying right here, this is what I call my solutions manual. If you clicked on the link that said solutions, manu solutions to chapter two review, this is what you'd get. The chat, the, um, this particular problem, it's worked out, more or less worked out, and all the answers are shown there with a bit of work. So to do the domain of any fraction, I take the denominator, set it equal to zero. It's the same here for number 10. I'm gonna go x minus three equal to zero. I'm gonna get x equal to three. That's gonna be the equation of my vertical asymptote, not the answer for the domain. For the domain, I'm gonna say it's all real numbers except and then in terms of a graph when I start to do the graph portion of this that means I'm going to find 3 on the x-axis and I'm going to draw a dashed vertical line and the graph is going to exist on either side of that but it's not going to cross that line or touch that line Next thing, horizontal asymptote, I take y equals, take the highest power x term in the numerator, divide it by the highest power x term in the denominator. Best situation is this, when the x's cancel. Here the x's cancel, and I'm left with y equal to 2. That's going to be the horizontal asymptote. So on the graph, I'm going to find 2 on the y-axis, draw a horizontal line through it, it would be nice if I labeled this vertical asymptote x equal to 3 and the horizontal asymptote y equal to 2. It's not a horrible thing if you don't. X-intercept, take the numerator equal to 0. Then we go 2x plus 6 equal to 0. Subtract 6, get 2x equal to negative 6. Divide by 3, get x equal to negative 3. So the x-intercept is going to be negative 3, 0. When I go to graph this, I'm going to mark that point and I'm going to write a coordinate next to it y-intercept plug 0 in for x, I get f of 0 equals 2 times 0 plus 6 over 0 minus 3. That's 6 over minus 3, which is minus 2. The y-intercept is going to be the point 0 minus 2. That's all I have to do by hand. Now I'm just going to sketch a graph of this function using that window, and I'm going to copy it in. So I'm going to take the function y equals clear parentheses 2x plus 6 divided by parentheses x minus 3 set my window negative 18 to 18 negative 8 to 8 hit a graph and copy what's on there again if I want to show the asymptotes it's easy to show them for the y asymptote of 2 if I just type in the number 2 it'll show that one nicely to get the vertical asymptote, I have to do some trickery because I can't draw a vertical line because it's not a function. If I did 1,000 times x minus 3, that will mimic the vertical asymptote but not really be it. And so that's what I'm going to copy onto my paper, making sure my graph physically goes through the x and the y-intercept. So my graph is going to look, you know, something is not necessarily perfect, but it's definitely close enough. Something like that would be fine. And putting arrows at the ends of these regions signifying the graph doesn't end would be even better. So there is a picture that's suitable. I have everything labeled that I want to label. I have the vertical asymptote, the horizontal asymptote, the x and the y-intercepts, and the rest of the graph kind of drawn reasonably well. Okay. So that's the end of that. One more graph, actually two more graphs. So 
11 is another graph. Again, ultimately, when you get, get to the test, you'll be given a blank window. It looks to a blank graph. Looks to me like my Y mins are going to be at the 4s. My Xs are going to be at the 14s. So when I go to finally sketch a graph, I know that this window is going to suit me. X min, negative 14. X max, 14. Y min, negative 4. Y max, 4. You'll absolutely be able to get that because there's going to be a blank graph on the test for you to insert your graph that will have numbers just like this has numbers on both the X and the Y axes. And you'll just need to do the work. So in a minute here, I'm going to start filling that up. First thing I do is work on the domain. For the domain, I take the denominator equal to zero. This factors into x plus seven times x minus three equal to zero. I'm going to set the x plus seven equal to zero and the x minus three equal to zero. The solution actually gives me the equations for the vertical asymptote, x equals negative seven and x equal to three. For the domain, I'll say the domain is all real numbers, except negative seven and three. I can draw these on my graph, and then again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm gonna estimate negative seven on the x-axis and three on the x-axis and draw my dotted vertical lines. It's nice doing them dashed so you can tell they're not the axes. And it's nice doing them in different colors as well so you can tell they're not the axes, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the dashed part is probably more important than the multicolored part. Next thing, horizontal asymptote. I write y equals highest power x term in the numerator is the x. In the denominator, it's the x squared. This gives me x over x squared. I cancel one of the x's. I'm left with an x in the denominator. So the x-axis, which has the equation y equal to zero, will be the horizontal asymptote. So when I draw this, I can not show this so well, but that has the equation y equal to zero. So I have my asymptotes in, and now I'm going to do the x-intercept by taking the numerator equal to zero. I get x minus one equal to zero. I add one, I get x equal one. The x-intercept is the point one, zero. The best I can, I go to my graph and I find the point that looks like one, zero. Again, it doesn't have to be ultimately perfect, perfect, just has to be reasonable. And then the y-intercept, I'm gonna go zero minus one over zero squared plus four times zero minus 21. That gives me minus one over minus 21. The two minuses come out to be positive. The y-intercept is the point zero comma one over 21. That is not going to show up really well on my graph because that point is just about at the origin. That point is just barely, barely above the origin. But I'm going to call this the point 0, 1 over 21. So I have all the features of my graph labeled. Now I just need to copy the graph in. I'm going to use those windows, that, win that window. So I'm going to go y equals clear, clear. And I'm going to go parentheses x minus 1 divided by x squared plus 4x minus 21. Make my window negative 14 to 14, negative 4 to 4. Hit my graph. That's not showing any of the um, asymptotes. The y equal to zero is the x-axis. I can't really show that, but I could do a thousand. I could do this. I could go a thousand times x plus seven. It gets something that mimics the x equal to negative seven and do a thousand times x minus three and get something that mimics the x equals to three, just so you could see those vertical asymptotes on there. And so that would be a reasonable picture. So I have a bottom left, a middle, and an upper right portion of the graph. I'm just going to copy those regions. So the bottom left, I'm going to write something, something, something like this. And then the upper right, I'm going to do something like this. Maybe arrows would be nice. And in the middle, I'm going to do something that goes through the intercepts. So it's going to go something like that, I guess. And again, this is probably not perfect, but I'm not striving for perfection here. This is good enough. Well, if you get to take a calculus class, 
you're going to use calculus to f kind of fill in the details of the graph and you'll do much more advanced uh, things but the basics of what we're doing here finding the vertical horizontal asymptotes x and y intercepts that will be a constant in calculus but in calculus the getting the graph you're not going to just steal it from your calculator so, but you use calculus to figure out how to do the rest of the graph last graph number 12 the domain I set the denominator equal to zero when I solve that I get the equation of the vertical asymptote x equal to 5 but not the answer for the domain for the domain I write all real numbers except 5 I'm going to show that on the graph, and again, I'll look at my answer to figure out what kind of window I'm going to be needing here. And this is a pretty extreme window. I have the y's at the negative 250s, the x's at the negative 19s. So when I go to do my graph, because of the slant asymptote, the windows need to be kind of exaggerated. And it looks to me like this window, x min, negative 19, x max positive 19, y min negative 250, y max positive 250 will work. And I don't match, I don't, didn't magically remember that, but I just looked at my solution and that's the window that I used. So I'm assuming that it's going to still work. Although I use a different program to do this graph than my calculator, and it's a little bit better than the calculator, but it still should work fine. So on my graph, I need to show the, uh, the vertical asymptote at 5. I'm going to find 5 on the x-axis, draw a dotted vertical line through it. I like using color and dashes. That's the beginnings of my work. Next thing I do is a horizontal asymptote, but this is actually a slant asymptote. I do 2x squared over x. That's 2xx over x. The x's in the denominator cancels, but I'm left with a non-fraction. That's the equation of my slant asymptote. Those I usually wait to graph until I get the window because if my x and my y axes don't have the same scale, it, they kind of get distorted. If you went to graph that, you, you'd graph it probably having your x min, x max, y min, and y max be the same numbers, and then your graph would be okay. But because my y's and my min and max is so different than my x min and max, it distorts the slope of this line. So I won't worry about that for a second. For the x-intercepts, I have to take the 2x squared plus 7x plus 5 and set it equal to 0. I'm going to bottoms up factoring this. And the bottoms up factoring, so I'm going to factor 2x squared plus 7x plus 5. I multiply the 2 and the 5 and get x squared plus 7x plus 10. Factor that into x plus 2 times x plus 5. I started off multiplying by 2. I'm going to divide by 2. I'm going to get an x plus 1 and a 2x plus 5. So ultimately, I need to be able to have some skills in factoring. And bottoms up is a nice skill. If you didn't already know how to factor that, this is properly factored. Now that I have it factored and set equal to 0, I'll set the x plus 1 equal to 0 and get x equal to negative 1. That's going to give me an x-intercept at negative 1, 0. I'll set the 2x plus 5 equal to 0. I'll minus 5 from both sides and get 2x is negative 5. Divide both sides by 2 and get x equal to negative 5 halves. And so that's going to be my other x-intercept, negative 5 halves, 0. I'm going to mark those, negative 1 and negative 2 and a half, you know, kind of estimate them. So this is going to be the point negative 1, 0. And this is going to be the point negative 5 half, 0, or negative 2 and a half, 0. I wrote decimals there. I'm content to do that. The window that I'm using isn't going to do a real nice job here. So um, I pr I'm going to do double window. I'm going to zoom in on this region to figure out what happens here, like I did in a few of the homework problems. And then I'll go back to the window that I was um, going to show for my final answer. Y-intercepts plug 0 in for the x's. I'm going to go 2 times 0 squared plus 7 times 0 plus 5 over 0 minus 5. 
That's going to give me a 5 over minus 5 because the pieces with the zeros cancel out. 5 over minus 5 is minus 1, so the y-intercept is 0 minus 1. And then I'm going to do a partial graph just to see what's happening right here. The window, if you look at the graph that I have in my key, the, the, the graph, you can't tell what's going on around the origin at all. That's because this window is so spread out from the origin. So I'm going to type the function in. Do 2x squared plus 7x plus 5 divided by x minus 5. And I'm going to do a really tight window. I'm going to go um, well, window. I'm going to go like x's from like negative 3 to six so I can get the vertical asymptote in there. And the y is really tight, maybe like negative two to two. And I hit graph, I'll see better what's happening at the x-intercept. So at the x-intercepts, the graph is going just a little above the x-axis. So in this region right here, the, you're not gonna see so well in the big window that the graph is doing something like that. So just, just to know that the graph just kind of does this. It crosses as opposed to touches at each of the x-intercepts, and that's that's a reasonable um, picture for what's going on. And now I'm going to blow it up to this big window, negative 19 to positive 19 on the x's, negative 250 to positive 250 on the y's. That's the graph that I'm going to copy. I'm going to put my y equals 2x slant asymptote in there. I'm going to go window, whoops, y equals, here's the y equals 2x slant asymptote. And if you want to show the vertical asymptote at x equal to 5, you type 1,000 times x minus 5 to mimic the vertical asymptote. It's not really a vertical line, but it looks vertical. And that's the picture I'm going to copy into my answer. So I have this region blown up a little bit better. It looked to me like this slant asymptote looks kind of like this on, the, on this window. And that's y equal to 2x, at least nice giving it an equation. And again, because the y's are so extreme relative to the x's, it kind of distorts really what this line looks like. And so it looks like the graph is just gonna go this and then work its way down like that. And again, I'm out looking for ultimate perfection here. Just something that looks like that. And what's kind of nice is I took the time to focus on this region around the x-intercepts because you can't see it from this window. So I made a special window just to get an idea of what's happening there so I could do something a little bit better. And that's, again, that's a reasonable graph for number 12. And I'm not expecting anything better than that. Last few problems are the problems with the greater thans and the less thans. These are the problems where I make just a couple cases up. So first for problem 13, I factor. This factors into x plus 8 times x minus 2 is less than 0. Because I'm looking for something less than 0, my two cases need to have opposite signs. For x plus 8 times x minus 2 to be less than 0, either one is the x plus 8 is positive and the x plus 2 is negative, or the x plus 8 is negative and the x minus 2 is positive. Solve these, plot them on a number line to figure out what my solution should be. This gives me x is greater than negative 8 and x is less than 2. To do that, I draw negative 8 and 2 on a number line. x is greater than negative 8 is a line going to the right of negative 8 x less than 2 is a line going to the left of 2. I'm looking for where I see both lines, and I see both lines between negative 8 and 2. That's the open interval between negative 8 and 2. We write that as negative 8 is less than x is less than 2. So this scenario gives that for the solution. The next region, I get x is less than negative 8 and x is greater than 2, so I plot negative 8 and 2 on my number line. x less than negative 8, I get a line going to, from negative 8 to the left with an open circle because of nowhere equal to. For x greater than 2, I get a line going to the right of 2, 
open circle because no or equal to. There's no overlapping here, so there's no solution from this. So the entire answer to problem 13 is just the answer that came from the first scenario that I wrote. That is 8, eight x is between negative 8 and 2. And that's how you write x is between negative 8 and 2. You use double less than with the x between the two. 14 is a greater than. Normally in the greater thans, we've been getting two different regions with an or between the answers. Factor this again. Factors into x plus 8 times x minus 3 is greater than 0. Create my two scenarios. My two scenarios have to have the same signs because for the, this product to be multiplied to be positive or greater than zero, either both the parentheses have to represent positive numbers or both the parentheses have to represent negative numbers. So my scenarios with a greater than have a double greater than or a double less than. My scenarios with a less than is one of each. When I go to solve this, I get x is greater than negative eight and x is greater than 3, find negative 8 and positive 3 on a number line. Greater than, I go to the right of negative 8, I go to the right of 3, I look for the region that has both graphs, and that's the region to the right of 3. The solution to this is x is greater than 3, because that's the region where I have double graphs. This next one, I get x is less than negative 8, and x is less than 3. I draw the region to the left of negative 8, to the left of 3 for less thans. I'm looking for both, both graphs. Both graphs occur for the x is less than negative 8 region. So this region, this scenario gets an answer of x is less than negative 8. My entire answer is going to contain both answers separated by the word or. So when each scenario gives an answer, then both answers need to be part of your answer separated by the word or. Two more to go. Fractions, fractions work the same way. First fraction, I have a less than. The two scenarios, there's no factoring here. The two scenarios are either the numerator is positive and the denominator is negative or the numerator is negative and the denominator is positive. My scenarios have to have opposites, one greater than, one less than, because the problem's a less than. The first scenario I have gives me x is greater than four and x is less than six. If I try to draw that, x is greater than four, I go to the right of four x is less than 6, I go to the right of 6. I get both lines in between 4 and 6, and I write that as x is between 4 and 6 with less than. So the, this region is x is between 4 and 6. The second scenario is going to be a no solution, because I get x is less than 4 and x is greater than 6. Put 4 and 6 in my number line. X is less than 4. I go to the left of 4. X is greater than 6. I go to the right of 6. The graphs don't intersect, so there's no solution for that part. The answer to problem 15 is just the answer to the first scenario is 4 is less than X is less than 6. If you wrote just the open interval with round parentheses 4 to 6 like that, that would be okay as well. Last problem. 16... I have a fraction that I want greater than zero. No factoring to do, but I do need to create two scenarios. The two scenarios will have the same signs, either both greater thans or both less thans, because when I'm dividing, if I divide two positive numbers, I get a positive, or if I divide two negative numbers, I get a positive. So my scenarios are that. And then I'm gonna graph each of these each one of these is going to give a solution, and I'm going to write an or between the two solutions, include both solutions in my answer. So this gives me x is greater than negative 4, and x is greater than 2. When I graph that, I graph negative 4 and 2 on a number line, go to the right of negative 4, go to the right of 2. 
my solution where I have both lines is the x is greater than 2 portion of the graph. So the solution to the first scenario, them both being positive, is x is greater than 2. Second scenario, I get x is less than negative 4 and x is less than 2. If I graph them, I go to the left of negative 4, to the left of 2, because less than is to the left. I get overlapping in the x is less than negative 4 region. I get both graphs appearing in that region. So the answer to that region is going to be x is less than negative 4. My answer is going to take those two inequalities and put an or word between them. And that would be the answer to problem 16. So that's the entire review. Hopefully it went moderately well. The test can't have anything on it that isn't like something on the review. The test has got to be shorter than the review because it took me well over an hour to do this. And you get like an hour and 15 minutes to take the test so that if I make it any, if I even made it the same length, you wouldn't have enough time to finish. So um, I try to make my tests so that I can do them really quickly, kind of in the 10 to 15 minute range with the idea that you should be able to finish them in an hour and then some of you will take the full hour in 15 minutes. But I generally try to write a test where most students can finish in an hour. All right, so visit me before you take the test if you're not feeling good about this because it's not going to get better if you don't understand it and you don't come for help.